Hi, I'm Ben Gramico from Natchi TV, and this is a home inspection training video. A while back, I performed a home inspection and took over 400 digital pictures, and I identified several major defects at the inspection. We're going to perform that home inspection once again, reviewing those pictures, and we're going to look at my actual inspection report that I handed to my client to go over narratives that I used in the inspection report and also some disclaimers. So. When I go to a home inspection, I carry big ladders. I carry 28 foot, 32 foot, and 40 foot ladders. Now, according to SOP, a home inspector is not required to get up on a roof and inspect. But at least you should get to the edge, the gutter edge. And this roof is in pretty good shape. What I like to do is take digital pictures of every plane or field of the roof. And then I take pictures like that. That kind of describes a lot. A uh, picture is worth a thousand words. That tells your client that you actually were upon the roof and taking your time looking in detail, I like that shot, about the condition of the roof, the shingles. This is a, a three-tab shingle that's about 10 years old. It's in pretty good shape. The granular surface is good, nothing major, no cracking. So the roof covering is in good shape. I don't say the roof system is in good shape, just the roof covering because a roof system combines multiple components into that system. So if you comment upon a system, you're including all of the components of that system. So the roof covering here is in good shape. And they have some new gutter helmets. Here's a defect. The neoprene member, um, membrane around the, the stack, the vent stack coming up through the roof is deteriorated. It's in poor shape, prone to water penetration. Here's a masonry chimney stack. This is on the east coast. And the size of the flue tells me it's probably not a fireplace flue. Haven't been inside yet. It's probably a heating system. And uh, in the, on the East Coast, oil-fired heating systems or gas-fired heating systems is pretty common. The crown is in poor shape. The masonry is cracked. It's been patched poorly and improperly in the past with just some silicone and some sealant and caulk all around the cracks. And it's still chipping away. And you can actually see some moss growth. Um, that's just going to hold moisture, and in the wintertime, that moisture is just going to pop and crack. This is an area prone to water penetration and moisture intrusion down the chimney stack, and masonry loves to wick up moisture um, and then crack. All of these joints here were patched with white silicone. I don't think they expected me to be up on the roof. It looks great from the ground. And this is the flashing. The counter flashing here is in great shape. Um, a little rusty, but... Um, my concern is how the top edge of the counter flashing is connected or secured to the brick masonry, especially when it's brick. Um, they didn't cut a groove. You like to see, I like to see a nice quarter inch groove cut into the masonry, and then you bend that top edge of the counter flashing in. Uh, that that um, detail is called a reglet, R-E-G-L-E-T. But right here, they don't have that. Uh, the top edge is simply sealed, and it's heavily sealed. Well, that requires maintenance and most homeowners are unable to, uh, they're unfamiliar with going up on their roof and doing this kind of maintenance. So um, I tell my client that this is an area that needs to be maintained regularly and that requires a roofer. The step flashing is not properly installed. You really shouldn't see step flashing, um, maybe an edge here and there, but the problem with this is now wind-driven rain can go at a diagonal under the step flashing and go where it's not supposed to go. More damage to the masonry. Now, this is the shot of the flue liner. Home inspectors, according to SOP, uh, visual inspection only. You're not required to inspect the interior flue, but um, you go as far as um, you are comfortable, or a home inspector only goes as far as they're trained, I guess. So I feel comfortable in taking this cap off. It's very easy. I carry a, uh, some tools, some screwdrivers, and some wrenches, and I pop the cap off. And I don't comment upon the flu system because I can't see the flu system, especially when um, I don't find major problems. This is a major problem that I can see, and so I'm going to comment on it. If I can't see anything wrong, I don't comment upon the condition of the interior flu. But I find that my clients um, 
find my inspections valuable when I actually stick my flashlight in and take a peek at the interior flue liner. And that is a major problem. That's a chunk of the interior flue, terracotta flue liner. Um, I just simply reached down with my hand and, and grabbed the piece because it was all deteriorated in pieces. Uh, you zoom in your camera a little bit in sections, go halfway and take a picture. You can see that there's missing pieces and cracks. This is the first piece coming down, three feet down. Uh, we're down to six feet and even more, more deterioration. There's a crack on the edge. You see maybe from, uh, visually from the top of the flu, 5% of the entire flu system. So do not comment upon the, the interior flu unless you're able to do something like this. And this is what I do. When I see a major problem, that's actually brick and mortar. You can see that's the outer wall of the chimney stack. So um, when I find a problem, um, a major problem especially, I communicate to my client the importance of getting a professional. And so in my inspection report, this is the third page, I believe. This is like the introduction. And let me read it to you. This is a disclaimer. Feel free to take any of the words and use it in your own inspection reports. But in every inspection report, and I've been doing this for 15 years, never had problems with this advice. I tell my client, you are advised to seek two professional opinions and acquire estimates of repair as to any defects, comments, improvements, or recommendations mentioned in this report. So if I mention anything, even commenting on anything, anything wrong or major or just something that needs to be improved, I'm telling my client, you need two professional opinions. We recommend that that professional who is making any repairs to inspect the property further in order to discover and repair related problems that weren't identified in the report. Take the flu, for example. I'm able to see only a small proportion of the flu found a major problem. I don't want that professional to come and fix the problem that I found. I want that professional to inspect further, fix the problems that I find, but also look at the entire flu system, drop a camera down all the way, and take 36, 360 degree pictures all the way down. So have your professional, tell your client to have your professional inspect the property further because I'm only doing a visual inspection. Contractors, when they have permission, tear things apart and discover. We recommend that all repairs, corrections, and cost estimates be completed and documented prior to closing or purchasing the property. This is really important. Your recommendations to get professionals to correct a repair um, is important, but the timing of those repairs is even more important. If you find a problem, your client may say, you know what, That's, that seems like a minor thing. We'll get that fixed after we buy the property. But if they follow your recommendations about having that professional inspect further and looking for more additional related problems, they better do it prior to closing because after closing, it's too late. And don't come to me, the home inspector, because I told you to try to get this done at least fixed or at least negotiated to be fixed prior to purchasing the property. And then I just put in some simple basic language. Feel free to hire other professionals to inspect the property prior to closing, like HVAC professionals, electricians, engineers, roofers. And that reinforces that you are a home inspector and you are not an expert. You're not an engineer or a professional at um, electrical work or electrical systems. You're not an electrician. You're just a, um, a generalist, not an expert. So continuing with the inspection, more step flashing problems. Here's the fireplace chimney, same condition, um, washed out, cracked crown, masonry crown, that needs to be chipped away. No more sealant on cracks. You can't put sealant on top of the masonry. Uh, and that's a picture, really, I take pictures for myself more than my client. This is a, uh, a visual record. I'm documenting the number of layers. So I go on the edge, the gable edge, and I take a look, and there's one layer of shingles. The vents. More of the, the lower, this is the lower roof, um, where the roof and wall intersect is critical. A lot of water problems and water intrusion problems occur there. This is um, a gable vent in the upper attic section above the second floor bedrooms. We have two problems here. Can you see them? One is I don't think the fan's positioned correctly. It's blowing out the siding. Now a fan here, this is a ventilation fan, um, a gable vent fan. The motor is right about here, it's about that large, and the fan blades are probably this big, but it's probably too low, and the fan blades are down here, 
and it's exhausting into the uh, siding and blowing out the siding. So it's not installed properly, possibly. I haven't been inside. I don't want to draw that conclusion until I actually see it. And then we have, looks like the siding there and some insulation board. That's open water penetration. We have this large hole that somebody put in and there's water coming down through behind the siding. You can actually see it dripping down here. So we have, here's a cupola. Um, most cupolas that I've found are decorative. They just sit them on top of a roof. But when you see copper flashing installed around a cupola, you can pretty much bet that it's an actual functional ventilation cupola where there's a hole here. So when you see damage here, it's not uh, damage on something that's cosmetic or decorative. This isn't a functional component of the ventilation of the roof system. So that's a major problem. Try to get to the edge. I try not to walk on the edge, but try to get to it visually if you can. Um, so here I decided to uh, take a look at the edge and there's no drip edge. The flashing is missing. Um, a lot of local building inspectors do not enforce this with their builders, but um, I put this in the report as a major problem because of this. Um, it doesn't always occur like this, but this is what happens when you don't have drip edge flashing and um, water uh, has water tension and it can go backwards and run up a roof and deteriorate this plywood sheathing. This is delaminated sheathing at the edge. This is below, uh, just above the gutter, gutters down here, and there's no flashing here. There's no ice and water shield either on the East Coast, that'd be a good idea. So that's all deteriorated. And it's hard to describe um, this condition, you can, to your client with words. A picture is really great. Um, you don't have to be uh, new home buyers who don't know a lot about sheathing and water damage and what it looks like can actually see. You know, I've got shards, pieces of wood in my hand. I was able to just reach in for about the first foot and just grab the sheathing. And this is the soffit underneath eaves. That's a great shot. You don't have to be an expert in plywood to understand what this is. It's a great way to communicate to your client the condition of the, the property. So the roof has a major defect all around the edge. That's two, uh, two pieces of plywood because these are intact, actually. The, the, the edges are good. It's not delaminated, but they uh, got wet and swelled and popped. So here's um, the actual report that I gave to my client. And I'd like to just read over this small section here. Um, uh, you could use this uh, type of language in your inspection report or um, this is what I use, and it's, it's helped me. I've never had any problems. I've never paid for any repairs on any roofs. Um, roofs may have leaked after my inspection, but I've never had to pay out of my pocket to my client. And I think it's because of the narratives and the disclaimers I use. So it's basic language. We're not professional roofers. Feel free to hire one prior to closing. We do our best to inspect the roof system within the time allotted. I like that. I refer to time. Home inspectors are doing the inspection for, what, an hour, two, three at most? There's a time restriction. Um, it's not just a visual inspection that's limited, but I'm actually limited also by time. We don't have all day here. The seller has intimate knowledge of the performance of the roof and the other systems in the house. Home inspectors, we go in, in and out, and you know we're expected to um, know everything that has happened about the performance of uh, let's, any system in the house. So within the time allotted, I did my best. We inspect the roof covering, drainage systems, flashing, etc. We're not required to inspect some things, so I tell them what to, I, I inspect, tell them what I don't inspect, so that they understand that, oh, there are things that my home inspector is not required to inspect. And this is not an exhaustive inspection of every installation detail of the roof system according to the manufacturer's specifications or construction codes. I've referred to this several times because roofers will go up. They know that I was there before them and they try to nail me on um, you know, the manufacturer's recommendations. Well, um, um, that's not what a home inspection is about. Oh, I also like this second paragraph. It's, visual, it's virtually impossible to detect a leak except as it is occurring or by specific water tests, which are beyond the scope of a home inspection. I want my client to understand that if I'm doing an inspection and it's a nice summery, a sunner, a sunny day in the summer, 75 degrees, hasn't rained for two weeks, well, you know, I'm not going to perform a water test to try to make the roof leak, and I can't tell if the roof's gonna leak in the future unless it's actually dripping down. Um, I can't tell that it's going to have problems. So these are my inspection pages. 
um, estimated age, condition. I throw a lot of digital pictures in the report. Not all of them I give to my client. Not all of them are in the inspection report, but a lot of them are the important ones, like the condition of the flu and the flu liner and the flashing. And there's the fireplace. That's all together. So here's the exterior. Uh, the downspouts, I work with the downspouts and the grading first and also take pictures of inspection restrictions. A lot of vegetation up against the side of the house. Vegetation and bushes and, and uh, mulch and landscaping is like sponge, sponges. They absorb water and they don't release it. They retain it and hold it up against the masonry. And masonry can wick, can wick moisture and water. And it can also hide stuff. Look at this, overgrown dense vegetation. You can make a check mark on your inspection report about dense vegetation, but I love a picture like this. And it's not just an inspection restriction, but it's also a recommendation for my client. Homeowners need to maintain their home. These dense bushes, uh, rose bushes, they're prickly, make it hard to um, give regular inspections on your home and to provide regular maintenance, simple maintenance. You can't get around there. And that's a critical area too. Don't like the downspout discharging onto the roof sideways. Uh, it really should be piped into the, the gutter. So grading shots, landscaping, some mortar joints need to repair. Um, that's a great shot. I can't see what's going on. That's about as close as I can, can get to the house. So there may be something beyond the scope of my visual inspection. Steel lintels, when you have a masonry house, look for steel lintels above doors and windows. Sometimes when the mason, masonry pops off, the rust forces the steel lintel to swell and actually pushes up on the brick and makes cracks. Now there's a whole wall of cracks above the window, prone to water penetration. It's not watertight. And you can't patch it with silicone. Silicone will just uh, deteriorate over time. Uh, water faucet. In the east where it's cold or in your cold climates, you want a frost-free hose bib. This is not. This is an older faucet. There's a couple problems here. It's not sealed. It's being pulled down by the uh, hose. And uh, there, are other, there are two other things in the picture that's interesting. This is a um, remote read for the water meter. Water meter is inside the house. This is a sensor that sends out a signal so that the water company doesn't have to come into the house to see the meter. And there's another thing in the picture that's important that I put in the report. The mousetrap. You're not required to inspect for mice, but if I see evidence of mouse droppings, I'm not an expert, I have a disclaimer, but if I see a mouse trap, I'm telling my client about the mouse traps. It's no big deal. I don't make a big deal out of it, but I do put in a report. This little guy's a vent. There's gas supply to the house. In um, the areas where I, I did inspections on, on this house, uh, the meters were put inside the house. Um, ideally, the meter would be on the outside. If you have a meter on the inside of the house, um, it needs to breathe. Gas meters have diaphragms. They actually flex like that, and it needs to breathe. And when you have a meter, a gas meter, on the inside of the house, you need a, a vent on the outside. Electric line exposed. A lot of exterior shots. Even the yard, the tree. I'm looking for any trees that may have an adverse impact on the house. Rotten uh, posts. This is a front porch post. This is the ceiling of the front porch. This is the gutter here. And so we have evidence of water leaking in and causing some cosmetic damage, but it's evidence of a major roof problem that we went over. Ground faults. Um, little tester can test for ground faults. Some inspectors use something a little bit more expensive. My sure test. Uh, the front porch masonry settled a couple inches over the lifetime of the house. They've been trying to seal it up with some silicone and some foam insulation. This is bad because you want hard surfaces, one, to slope away from the house. And if it's not, like this one, you don't want poor sealant or caulking here because it will allow water to um, go into the house foundation. The problem is, if it's done by the homeowner, it's probably not attached. So grab the edge and this one was loose. It could flip and hurt somebody. Outdoor water spigot is coming from the basement down below. So they uh, know that if this is going to freeze in the wintertime and burst. So they try to insulate it with some foam insulation. That doesn't work either. Bay window, copper roof. But look at all the silicone. 
So they have problems with whoever did the flashing, they didn't install, install the cut, the groove, into the masonry so that they bend that metal right in there and then put a nice bead of silicone on top. Uh, side porch, uh, side stoop uh, at the side door, uh, settled, caused a trip hazard. So I take a lot of pictures to describe the condition of the house so I can communicate to my client appropriately. And also it's a visual record of what I did, like testing the photoelectric eyes on the garage door. Uh, I like these shots because it can tell somebody that this is a visual inspection and these are the actual restrictions. I don't know of any inspection report, software system or by hand, pencil and paper, that can uh, describe all the inspection restrictions, even the, all the little components, um, in, a, in an efficient amount of time. Uh, you can't describe that there's a ladder, garbage can, wheelbarrow, other garbage can, plywood, up against the wall. A digital picture does it all very quickly. The concrete is settling. This is a garage concrete, and there's moisture percolating up from the ground. It wasn't coming in from the sides. So this garage floor probably wasn't poured. It's probably not very thick. It may have been poured on sand. Concrete shouldn't be poured on sand. Maybe there's no vapor barrier. Uh, missing handrail going up those steps from the garage to the interior. Uh, missing firewall garage door. New electric line. New service, drip loops, secured and attached. There's the grounding wire going to the electrode, the grounding rod. Um, new electric panel, 200 amps. I like to take a picture of the panel for a few reasons. Um, one is a record of all of the breakers that were in the on position and off position. Because sometimes I've taken the covers off and I flick one of the breakers by mistake. And I want to make sure that I reset it. Um, so we have room for expansion. That's the 200 amp main disconnect. We have older wiring, some newer Romex, wire, Romex wiring. Um, this should be sealed to stop uh, airflow, uh, water vapor intrusion, and insects. And there's no labeling. Every breaker in the electrical panel must have um, specific identification of its purpose and location. There's nothing here. And there are no arc faults or ground faults in that panel either. There's some loose wiring all about the house in the garage. There's wire there, wire there, wire going across the window, wire lying in the corner of the garage, going up the wall. No ground faults in the garage. Loose wiring, loose Romex. Now again, you, don't, you have to know your SOP. You're not required to take the electrical panel off. Uh, an inspector only goes as far as they've been trained. I encourage um, as much training and education as possible. And um, if you're not confident in taking off the electrical panel, do not do it. I love this shot because it tells me what breakers are on and off again, if I, and the general condition. Do I have water penetration, scorching, overwired heaters? Um, I see that I don't have any double taps. The wires look really great. Nothing scorched, nothing overfused. Um, this is a, a double pole breaker. I like to see some black tape on the, the white wire. They poured asphalt, new asphalt, about two or three inches of new asphalt on top of the old stuff. That's how they did it to make it look nice. But the asphalt surface, the hard surface of the asphalt driveway, is actually higher than the garage door, which is OK if you insert a drainage system. Um, ideally, all hard surfaces slope away from the house to stop water intrusion. And uh, this hard surface is above and directed towards, so you need to catch that water. And they actually sell this type of system at Home Depot. Uh, you, you groove out the asphalt, you dig a trench, and you put it right back in. Water main coming in, water line through a shutoff valve. I think this is in the crawl space. Goes into a water meter. Sorry, it's a little out of focus goes um, up and through a check valve and pressure regulator. I like to have the pressure regulator before the water meter. I don't know why this was on the downstream side of the water meter. And uh, I have a bonding wire coming from the electrical panel to the copper water line, but no jumper. Now, if you remove, I have friends in the east who have removed water meters, and uh, they didn't pay attention to the jumper missing, and they got a little electric shock. Shots of the crawl space. 
I like to take a lot of shots of the crawl space. The crawl space ceiling, the floor system above the crawl space was insulated, which is really nice, but it's an inspection restriction for me. So I actually bring, don't have it with me, I, have a, I bring a, um, a gardening tool. It's a three tine hoe, has three tines on the end of it. Um, I bend them, one straight, one's curved, and one's really curved, and it's extendable from two feet to four feet, and I push the insulation around, and I want to tell my client that I did it the best that I can by pushing the insulation around with my instruments, and I take a lot of pictures of different spots of the floor joists. We have some efflorescence because the foundation on this old house is probably uh, not waterproofed. There's no drainage system on the outside, so it's probably concrete block right upon fill. Um, I doubt that they have even gravel out there, drainage gravel. And so that block, um, it might be parged with some tar, but it gets wet and absorbs moisture and it leaves the salt deposits behind. But no structural problems in the crawl space. Drainage pipes look good. Uh, this is a gas pipe with a valve, a flex line, and the strap that held it in place has broken. And so now the gas line is just hanging. I think it's hanging on a, a bonding wire. Um, if that wire wasn't there, it probably would have just fallen and there would have been a gas leak. So we'll see that again. That's the hot water tank. Sometimes I just put my screwdriver in in areas where there is a high probability of um, infestation, subterranean, eastern subterranean termite infestation. Um, this is in the crawl space. If you've ever been in a crawl space with some knee walls or walls, to the finished area. This is the back side of it. This is a seal plate. It's not treated. Stud coming up. Right there is usually where the termite infestation starts because this is food for termites. That's food. That's food. That's food. And this is some mold, um, mold deposits here. Um, well, suspected mold. You never know that it's mold until you test it. So we carry some swabs. You swab it a little bit, send it to the lab, and confirm that it's mold. There's drainage pipes. This is the hot water tank. Amazing hot water tank. I'll show you why. Take a picture of the um, manufacturing plate. We have the model number, BTU, a recovery rate by gallons, capacity, serial number. Here's the reason why it's an amazing tank. It was built in 1976. And uh, I just inspected this house a little while ago. Uh, we have scorching. And so um, something's wrong with the vent pipe. Maybe there's a block, the draft is wrong. I understand that this shield is missing, but this flame shield of the combustion chamber is in place, but we have scorching. That's really, really dangerous. And there's the gas line. This is dangerous too. The gas line has fallen to the hot water tank. The main shutoff valve, the cold water line on the, to the tank has dripped and rusted out completely the top of the tank. The vent pipe carrying the exhaust gases into the chimney stack is loose, not sealed where it enters the chimney. Uh, pressure relief valve, it could be dripping, but it's missing its tension pipe. AC unit is new. Take a picture of the manufacturing plate, get your camera and set it. It's very easy to take hundreds of digital pictures if you set your quality to low, that's all you need for reports, and um, set it to macro to get in nice and close within a few inches. And you can get pictures of the date, that helps me. Uh, it's only a few years old, 2002. Electric disconnect. There's the HVAC system. Same uh, manufacturer and same date as the uh, air conditioner unit. And we're good with this, no major defects. Real quick, what's the efficiency of this heating system? If you can't tell within, if you can't say within the first few seconds, um, possibly I recommend taking some training. Uh, HVAC, we have an HVAC training course, InterNACHI and NACHI TV has uh, one of the best training videos for HVAC training for inspectors. Um, we don't have a gravity system, so it's not low. It's not 60, 65 percent. And um, so we, we have things that uh, can tell you the efficiency real quick. We have a draft inducer fan. When you have a draft inducer fan, that brings you up from 60, 65. Now we're thinking 80, 85, or maybe more, 90, 95. We have a valve. Um, the structure of the valve, you'll get used to seeing this. This isn't a standing pilot light. Standing pilot light mechanisms look different. And um, if we keep going, 
Uh, that's an electric shutoff switch. I take pictures of all the components, gas shutoff. This is the draft fan again. How many fans are here, actually? You say draft fan, but there are actually two fans. One it makes the draft and one cools off the fan. One's actually just cooling off. Here's the valve, um, sorry, uh, the light, the pilot light. Um, so you have a draft inducer fan, that raises up the efficiency, and you have an intermediate, intermittent pilot light. This one actually is a glow plug, like a diesel engine. Um, it glows red hot, the gas valve opens up, and that um, glow plug lights up the, the fuel and ignites it and shoots them in these burner ports. Did you know uh, you can tell roughly, by general rule of thumb, the BTU system, uh, the BTU capacity by counting the number of burners? The HVAC system. Here's a um, high efficiency depleted media air filter. Check out the airflow arrow. It's in good shape. Take pictures of both sides. This is the, the dirty side, but it's clean, so it's new. I take a picture of the service record. That tells me a lot. Humidifier. It's a bypass humidifier. I can tell that real quick because it's installed on the cold air return and there's a big duct going to the supply return. It's called a bypass to bypass the critical part, the HVAC, the heating system and the air conditioning system, especially the heat exchanger. You don't want this humidifier, which has a lot of water in it, dripping water, to be installed on top of the heating system control. There's the shot, I open these up you're not required to in, uh, inspect the components of them inside, but I do. Um, take some training to learn how humidifiers work, but they're all based upon either a filter like this that can be replaced when it gets all funky with calcium, or a drum. And water, this is the water line, comes up here, it trickles down, this filter gets wet, air comes through it, gets humidified, and takes that moist air into the supply and circulates it water line. Here's the evaporator coil for the air conditioner unit. Uh, two lines. Which one's the suction line? Which one's the liquid line? Uh, suction line's larger. It should be cool to the touch. It's insulated. Um, the liquid line is warm to the touch. Condensate air um, conditioners, evaporator coils produce condensate. This is the main condensate drain line. And this one is a secondary backup. Um, it's usually installed when there's an uh, air handler in the attic. Just in case this gets clogged, this one drains into a catch pan. And why are these two here? What are these? These two are being used. Why are these here? Because you can tip it. This is a universal system. You can tip the evaporator. Condensate pump plugged in. Shot of the flue going up. We know we have major problems with the flue liner. And so here's the report. Nothing really to go over. No major problems, just identifying the components. Every picture has something, like this is the humidifier. I have three pictures of the humidifier, three pictures of the air filter. On Natchi TV, we have an awesome training video for home inspectors, HVAC training for inspectors. On Natchi TV, it's all online, and it's all video. So if you need some more experience or more confidence in inspecting your client's heating system, um, if you don't know exactly like the refrigerant cycle, the refrigerant cycle is described really well in the training video. We do it about three times. Um, after you watch the video, you'll be able to tell your, your client how the air conditioner system or heat pump works. Heat pump uh, just is an air conditioner system in reverse. So I take pictures of the rest of the room and the rest of the rooms in the house, all the rooms. And in this particular room, we have uh, some water stains. Uh, we have, I have a moisture meter probe. Um, a lot of inspectors use the handheld ones. Um, this one's extendable, so I don't have to reach down and get the, the ceilings or the low spots. But this is active water penetration. And I'm not sure why all of that baseboard and carpeting and wall is wet. So I take a picture on the outside, and that's where the water's coming from. This dense vegetation area, there could be some kind of um, drainage problem here. There could be water puddling up, and it goes down the brick wall, or it could be from that bay window, we have that poor flashing and connection to the masonry. Water could be coming down the masonry wall. It's unable to drain out. Maybe there are no weep holes or they're blocked and it goes down into the basement. Take pictures of all the fixtures in the house, the ceilings, open and close the windows and doors. I don't do all the windows and doors within the time allotted. 
uh, laundry. Black rubber hoses, they're not pressure tested. These uh, break open and uh, they, they wait until you're on vacation and they burst open and your house floods with water. That's one of the number one claims of homeowners insurance policies, um, those hoses bursting open. So they make um, pressure tested hoses, braided mesh hoses and high quality hoses. Missing ground fault at the laundry area. Dryer vent pipe should never be plastic. Uh, the dryer is hardwired. There's no outlet. The dryer appliance should have a pigtail and a, a, a pronged outlet and uh, a wall mounted outlet. Um, I didn't do a termite inspection here, but uh, I should, all home inspectors, in my opinion, should be trained on identifying wood destroying organisms, insects. This is um, Krupner ants. Um, and they fell behind. This is a window blocked with some foam insulation for the winter, I think. I opened that up and they fell down. You should be able to identify. So you don't have to do a termite inspection, but if you see a big pile of insects, your client may say, what do you think those are? And those were carpenter ants. Um, the thermostats in the house. This is the attic shot. No structural problems. No roof leaks. Nothing active. Be careful with the recessed ceiling lights, these can lights. Um, the old ones, they're not supposed to be um, in direct contact with the insulation, so they, they did a nice thing. They put it away, pushed it away, and, and blew the uh, cellulose insulation in. And, but the problem is um, this creates um, vapor problems. Um, it creates a stack effect in cold climates. Um, in, in the wintertime, you heat up the air in your house. You pay for a lot of heat in your house, and it goes up right through the attic floor, right here. And uh, there's moisture being carried by that warm air, and there's also um, a heat loss area, for it, so you're wasting energy. Um, I love the shots of the insulation thickness. It's not too much insulation, cellulose insulation, only about five inches thick, not very thick at all, about half of what it should be. This is the access door to the attic. Um, access panels, access doors, scuttles in the ceiling, if they're not insulated, it's equivalent um, to having about 100 cubic feet per minute of warm air that you've paid a lot of money to heat up just go right through. Uh, it's equivalent to having um, a supply register in a bedroom. An uninsulated attic door is just a huge hole, and you've got to inform your client about that, and you should have some knowledge of the stack effect of homes and energy loss and water vapor, how water vapor moves in the house when there's airflow. Plumbing, light fixtures, old light fixtures with um, the little plug, electric outlet, those should be disconnected or protected by a ground fault or just removed and replaced with a new one. I pound the tiles with my hand and take pictures of them. I did everything I could to see if these old tiles with the old grout lines have allowed water to penetrate through and behind. This is a shower pan. Below it is uh, a ceiling that had no water marks, but these old shower pans, um, some of them are made out of lead and with some uh, thick masonry, they sometimes crack, and you can never tell a shower pan's leaking until it actually drips, just like a roof system. And to take some pictures of other windows, second floor windows, receptacles, they're two prong, uh, no grounding prong. Little tester that I have just to see if it's live. Do all the windows and doors that I can. Um, this is a safety hazard for children. Railings should not have openings that would allow a four inch in diameter sphere to pass through. Looking for water marks, water penetration, anywhere, any nook and cranny, I'm trying to take a picture of it. Here's the fireplace, the fireplace door handle on the glass front is broken. The masonry interior looks good. I'm not a fireplace, I'm not a certified chimney sweep. I'm not going to say uh, anything that I'm, on, I'm not trained to do. And so uh, I just do the functional damper opening, closing, and take some pictures here and there. I'm looking for major, major defects. Didn't see any. Interior keyed deadbolts. Interior keyed deadbolts can make an emergency exit difficult. Um, where I did inspections in Pennsylvania, that's not allowed. It has to be removed for the house to be sold. And here's the kitchen. No ground faults in the kitchen. Take a picture of the inside. Uh, this tells you a lot about damage or stained dishwashers. Dishwashers stain. Uh, I don't know why, when the new homeowner moves in, something's not working. Um, I turn them on by, uh, cur for courtesy to my client. Home inspectors are not required to turn on dishwashers and kitchen appliances, but I do. 
out of courtesy. See if they turn on. And the last thing in the kitchen was the edge of the vinyl. They put down some vinyl, but they didn't um, mechanically attach it or glue it down. So here's the report conclusion. Um, just before I get to a summary, I put this up and I tell my clients um, this. We're proud of our service and trust that you will be happy with the quality of our report. We've made every effort to provide you with an accurate assessment of the condition of the property and its components and to alert you of any significant defects or adverse conditions. However, this is the important part, we may not have tested every outlet and opened every window and door or identified every problem for the numerous reasons, the instructions, the limitations, the exclusions. So when they find an outlet that's dead, well, it's not an exhaustive inspection. I don't test every outlet. I don't open and close every door. And there are going to be problems that a new homeowner will find. Basic, simple language, tell them how it is. Also, because our inspection is essentially visual, latent defects could exist. So when the new contractor comes in because they're going to replace some cabinets in the kitchen and they take it off and they see, who knows, some structural problems or water problems or termites, well, that was latent, uh, hidden, not visual. We cannot see behind walls. I love that little sentence. I say that often. I, sometimes I meet with clients who have problems and I highlight this with a little highlighter marker and you know, just to describe in basic language the home inspection's responsibility and limitations. Therefore, you should not regard our inspection as a guarantee or warranty. It's simply a report on the general condition of a property at a given point in time. As a homeowner, you should expect problems to occur. It's an amazing sentence because a lot of new homeowners assume that everything's going to be hunky-dory for the whole house and that if a problem occurs, it's not their fault or responsibility. It's got to be somebody else's. Well, that's not true. Roofs will leak. Basements may have water problems. Systems may fail without warning. We cannot predict future events. For some reason, they think a home inspection is a warranty into the future, or you can see what's going to happen into the future a year from now. I have no idea what's going to happen to the roof a year from now. For these reasons, you should keep a comprehensive insurance policy current. That's where you go if you have your clothes washer lines burst open. Don't come to the home inspector. inspector. Make sure your house is covered with uh, an insurance policy. And then I thought of walkthroughs, pre-closing walkthroughs, last chance effort for the, your client to look at the house before they sign on the dotted line. And so I put this in my uh, in inspection report. All of my inspection reports have this. Pre-closing walkthrough. A walkthrough prior to closing is the time for the client to inspect the property. Some clients don't even realize that they have this right to go into the property before they uh, purchase it and take a look one last time. Conditions can change between the time of a home inspection and the time of closing. They can change. Things can happen. Restrictions that existed during the inspection may have been removed for the walkthrough. So a uh, living room carpet may have been pulled up and then revealed, let's say, a big hole in the floor. Well, at the time, my digital pictures will show that this living room carpet was over that hole and there's no way to see it. But just before closing, you may be able to come in. That carpet may have been removed prior to closing. And then that hole is visual to whoever's walking through, hopefully my client. Defects or problems that were not found during the home inspection may be discovered during the walkthrough. That carpet may be pulled up and that hole may be revealed. Therefore, the client should be thorough during the walkthrough. And any defect or problem discovered during the walkthrough should be negotiated with the owner or seller of the property prior to closing. That's essential. Again, it it's, refers back to that chimney problem. I discovered a problem with the chimney. I expect my client to get a couple estimates and a professional to inspect the property even further and make those corrections prior to closing, or at least negotiate about those uh, problems prior to closing. If you find something during the walkthrough in the morning of, just before you sign on a dotted line, you should get that fixed or at least negotiated prior to closing. Purchasing the property with a known defect or problem releases me, the inspector, of all responsibility. Client assumes responsibility for all known defects after the settlement. If, you, if, if during the inspection I didn't see that hole that was covered up by the carpet in the living room, prior to closing, conditions have changed. That carpet is 
pulled up, a hole is revealed. You go through prior to um, uh, closing, bef before you sign on a dotted line through your walkthrough, you see the hole. You say, well, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the, that later after we buy the house. We'll call up the home inspector and he'll handle that. Oh, no. You saw the defect prior to closing. You had your chance. That's what the purpose of the uh, pre-closing walkthrough is all about, to look for the condition again. And if you know that there's a hole in the living room and you buy the house, you bought a, ho a, a hole. So I love this paragraph. It gives you, um, it reinforces again the limits of the in inspection that you do, the time limits, and it gives your client this idea of, yeah, I can go through before I purchase the house and look for any kind of problems. And if, if there is a problem, I have the time and the ability and the right to negotiate over that problem prior to closing. So that's the end of the training video. Um, for the best online training for inspectors, building inspectors, residential and commercial, go to InterNACHI and NACHI TV. We've combined to produce the best training that you can get. All of the courses are online, and on NACHI TV, all of the training courses are uh, video. So um, thank you very much for NACHI TV. I'm Ben Gramico. See you next time.